Welcome to the service this morning. Glad that you arrived safely after all your celebrating yesterday, and hopefully you probably ate some, maybe too much, but you survived. That's the point, and we're glad you're here today, and trust that those of you who are joining us online, God will minister to your heart as well as those who are here in the auditorium this morning. Just a couple of announcements that we'd like to call to your attention. Pastor John and his family are in Indiana uh, for the Christmas week, and we'll be returning, Lord willing, tomorrow, so trust that you'll remember them in prayer as they travel. Also remember that uh, the life groups will not be meeting tonight or next week, uh, but we uh, will be having Sunday school next week, but just no life groups in the evening uh, during the Christmas holiday. We, were, we are in the process of beginning a new men's ministry, which focuses on small groups of men meeting and just discussing biblical issues and how it relates to their own lives. If you'd like some information about this, I have a little booklet prepared in my office. I'd be glad to get it for you, and we'd love to have you consider participating uh, in that meeting. It will meet about once a week, and uh, we anticipate it will be something that God will just wonderfully use in the lives of, of our men. We want to read, as we begin today, a passage from Hebrews chapter 10. It's in your worship guide, if you can turn there. I'm going to be speaking this morning about faith. What is faith? How does it work? How do we work with faith? How do we apply it, apply it to our everyday life? One of the great passages about faith is Hebrews chapter 11. So we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse 38 through the end of the chapter, and then read down to verse 6 of chapter 11. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back his soul, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back into perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is not blind. Faith is not without reason. Faith has substance and faith has evidence. Verse 2. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him, but before his translation, he had this testimony, that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So we're going to be looking this morning, what is faith all about? How does it work in your life? How do you use it on a daily basis? And we're going to begin by singing one of my favorite Christmas songs, Good Christian Men Rejoice. Let's stand, shall we?
remain standing. Let's bow together for prayer. Heavenly Father, at this Christmas time, we especially remember your kindness to us, demonstrated in sending your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to sacrificially come to this earth, a king to be a servant, that we, through him, might have the joy of everlasting life. We thank you for the hope, the assurance, the confidence that we have because of Christ, that one day we shall be with you, and that through our lives, after we know, that, after we know you, you are with us. We do ask, Lord, that you would bless our many missionaries as they labor around the world. We think particularly today of Julius Katengi, who is in Kenya, and pray that you would use him there, Lord. We know that this is a land where there's been a great drought and great difficulty in even finding food. So protect them, Lord, and provide for them and care for he and his church and churches and the members that are there as they struggle to, to live and survive. We pray for your supernatural and wonderful provision for them. We pray that you'd make them effective in their serving as they seek to reach the people of their community with the gospel. We pray for our nation, Lord, as we are seeing and experiencing widespread turning from you and turning from the principles of your word. We're reminded that the scripture makes clear that in the latter days, men shall become worse and worse, not better and better, that they shall... Uh, be unthankful, unholy, that they will forget about God, that they will forget about the principles of Scripture. But help us to remember, Lord, that you demand of us, you require of us to be faithful regardless of the circumstances around us. So give us wisdom. And in this time, help us, Lord, to be effective in reaching our relatives and our friends and our neighbors and our co-workers with the gospel. Give us boldness to clearly proclaim the truth of Scripture to those who are around us, that many might turn in faith to Christ and come to know him as their Savior. We ask, Lord, for those many whose lives have been devastated by the tornadoes through Kentucky. We pray for your protection. We pray especially that you'd provide for your people and care for them, and that you would just bless that through these great tragedies that there might be great glory brought to your name, and many in this time of great sorrow uh, would turn to you, so we commit them to, to your care. Help us, Lord, each day to believe your word, to apply it to our lives, to live it out in a way that it demonstrates that we know you and that you are in the process of effectively changing our lives. Help us to teach the children of our church, our own children, to love you with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind, that they would love you for a lifetime and that they would see that uh, surrender, dedication, and love for you in the lives of those who worship here among them. So we ask for your blessing, your power, your wisdom, and your guidance in our lives today, and we pray in the precious name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. We're delighted to have you here today. You may be seated. There is a guest card uh, either in the pew in front of you, if you fill it out and drop it in the uh, offering box, or give it to an usher. We have a gift for you, a book about what the church is intended to do today. Uh, you may have that as you leave. Just see one of our ushers, and they'll be delighted to get that to you today. <clears throat> we're going to look at a second hymn, uh, but first of all, we're going to memorize or work on our scripture memory. First um, Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through verse 6 today. Some wonderful truths in this passage of scripture regarding assurance of our salvation and, and the joy of knowing Christ. So we'll read these uh, together and uh, beginning at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. You know, verse um, 5 is such a precious verse to those who know Christ. We are kept by the power of God. We're not kept because we're so good. We're not kept because we're so wonderful. We're not kept because God needs us. We're kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. 
All right, we're going to sing next, uh, Go Tell on the Mountain. So we sing the chorus first and then the verse. Let me get a little correction here. Do we sing chorus after each verse or just after the last one? Okay, start with the chorus and then the chorus after each verse. Music is not my long suit. After the first verse, we sing the chorus on top of the right, right page, and then after the second verse, we sing the chorus at the bottom. You'll see the note there, chorus for second verse. Ring the bells, ring the bells. to our text this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 
And then we actually have uh, two more songs we're just going to sing from memory. We don't have a special this morning, so you will be the special, the choral special this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're going to read verses 1 through verse uh, 10. This is often a passage that is read at a funeral because of the hopefulness that is found in these verses. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning at verse 1, and we'll read through verse 10. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle, that's talking about our bodies, earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so, be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought for us this selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. The earnest here is the down payment. Uh, the down payment of your salvation is that God put his Spirit in you. And by putting his Spirit in you, that's his down payment saying, this is not the final transaction, this is just the beginning. That will one day be realized when we come to know Christ. And Paul makes very clear in verse 6 then, Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether pleasant, present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So we'll be focusing on verse 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We're saved by faith, but we also walk by faith. Okay, we're going to be singing the first Noel, which you all know the first verse of that, and Silent Night, you all know that. So there's no words behind me. You're just going to have to rely upon your memory. <laughs> going to ask you to sing the other verses you may not have them memorized but I'm sure you know the first one silent night now you're a good choir so far Congratulations. We are going to be looking at the topic today, rather than expositing a passage of Scripture, as we often do. We're going to be looking at a number of passages of Scripture, but we're going to be focusing on this idea of faith. This is the last Sunday of 2021. How you face your problems, your struggles, your decisions of next year will largely be determined on how you address this issue of faith. How you face your challenges, how will you, all the things that we encounter won't be things that we know are coming, 
they'll all be a surprise. We don't know everything that's coming this coming year, do we? We don't even know most of them, actually. We do not know what life will bring us, but our plan is to live in accord with chapter 5 and verse 17. Or verse 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Now, Christians who have been saved know that we're saved by faith. It's by grace, God's kindness, God's goodness, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ or trust in the Lord Jesus Christ that we're saved from our sins. However, the Bible also says that we should live by faith. And I think sometimes that the living by faith becomes more of a struggle for some for folks than the trusting of Christ in their salvation. Some people say, well, what, what really is faith? What, it do I must, what must I do to be faith? It must be certain that we walk by faith, not just hear about it, not just think about it. What is faith? Is it just believing there is a God? If that's all there was, 90% of the world would, would go to heaven because if that's all they had to do, just believe there is a God. Uh, they'd all go to heaven, but Jesus said most people won't go to heaven. Narrow is the way that leadeth to life, and few there be that find it. Is it saying you believe the Bible? Is it uh, being a member of a particular faith group? I've heard folks say to me when you ask them about their salvation, oh, I have a faith, or I have a church, I have a faith. Is it simply holding to the truths of the Christian life? Well, let's, let's define it. Let's define faith for just a moment. that specifically apply to your current situation so sincerely that you will be willing to act on them whether you see what the outcome will be or not. You're willing to act on the truths of Scripture as written in the Word of God whether you see how they will work out or not. I think one of the real hindrances, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, of people living the Christian life is they're afraid if they take a step of faith how it will work out or perhaps how it won't work out would be more realistic. In Hebrews chapter uh, 9 and verse 7, we have the first thing that we want to see this morning, and that is the fact that God gives us several things by which we act on faith. One of those things is warnings. God gives us many warnings throughout the Scripture. Everybody in the world knows that at the end of this life, we're going to die. Uh, from the first time a child sees one of his relatives die to a person who's 90 years old, we know that at some point our bodies are not going to survive and we are going to leave this body behind and we're going to die. Now, what people believe beyond that affects their actions in this life. Well, we just died, just put you in the grave, that's it. I had a man tell me he was a Native American. He said, well, when I die, I just want to go out in the prairie somewhere and just lay down and die. And I said, well, I don't think local coroners allow you to do that. I think they have to take care of a body somewhere. You're not just allowed to just go out in the weeds and lay there. And that's it. We all have to die. What we think about what we will do in order to have security after death is faith. And so the first thing that God does is he gives us warnings. He gives us warnings about life. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26 and 27 says, For then must he, Jesus, often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. For as it is pointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. That's a warning. God gives a clear warning. I've just been reading through Jeremiah in my devotions. And uh, Jeremiah is telling the people of Judah, look, you are going to be captured by Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar is coming. He's going to capture this city. The city is going to be burned, and many thousands of people will be killed. And they said, no, God will never let that happen to Jerusalem. And he said, it's going to happen. He said, the best thing for you to do is surrender. And they said, you're a traitor telling us to surrender. But they wouldn't believe. And what happened? Babylon came. Nebuchadnezzar came. They were overcome, overpowered, thousands were killed, many were taken into captivity into Babylon and lived out their years there, just as God had said. But they failed to believe and they failed to act. Warnings aren't given just so we know a warning. God didn't just remind us that we're going to die just so that we know we're going to die, but so that we do something about it. Acts chapter 17 and verse 30 says, And at the times of this ignorance God winked at, 
but now commanded all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which all will, in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men that he hath raised him from the dead. We have the assurance that, and the confirmation from history, from facts of people who actually saw it, that Jesus was raised from the dead. God says, there's a warning, you're going to die. Because you have that warning, you need to take action and do something to ensure that you're going to go to heaven. Isaiah, the prophet, wrote in Isaiah 55 and verse 6, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. So what God is clearly saying here is, okay, here's the warning. You are going to die. Now, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to prepare? You prepare by repenting and placing your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as your only hope of heaven. Now, all of us here know that we're going to die one day. Have you taken the steps to ensure that heaven will be your home? Have you repented and placed your faith in Christ? Actions of confessing our sins and asking God to save us through Christ who died for us is absolutely essential. We will not go to heaven without that knowledge of Christ, without that personal knowledge of Christ. The second thing that God gives us, commands, are the second. Warnings first, then commands. Here in Mark chapter 8, verse 34b and 35, Whosoever shall come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's, the same shall find it. For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Now here's a command. In the first verses, a couple that we looked at, God was warning, hey, death is coming, and you need to be prepared. Now he's saying, here's what Christians must do. They need to deny themselves, take up the cross, and follow me. Taking up the cross is an interesting concept because it doesn't mean that you have a burden that you were given. Some people say, well, I have a health condition, and that's the cross that I have to bear. Now, that's not what this verse is teaching. What he's teaching is you take up, you take up the cross. Not a cross that was put off on you, not a burden that was laid on you, but a cross you take up, the cross of service, the burden of service, the burden of difficulty of living for Christ and live for him. You take up that cross. That's a command. And by faith, we say, I will live for Jesus Christ without any reservation. I will give myself without reservation to him completely. That's his command. The third thing God gives us is promises. If ye abide in me, John 15, 7, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Have you ever hesitated to pray because you said, well, God probably won't answer this anyhow? He said, if you abide in me, you have that ongoing personal relationship where you're walking with God. If you have that relationship with him, you can ask anything that is right for you to have, and he will give it to you. God then will guide you what is best for you. It won't be a selfish request. It'll be a request that is in line with the will of God. You know, I haven't counted these personally. I read somewhere one time where someone said, there are 30,000 conditional promises of God. If you want to check that out and number them for me, that will be fine. I'm just not going to do that this week. But here's one of them. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you confess... He will forgive. Now, that's written to Christians. Christians who fall into sin and allow something to come into their life that's sinful, if they confess their sins, God will forgive them. God will cleanse them of those sins. So we have three things here, warnings, commands, and promises. And based upon those three things, we act on faith. Because God warned me, I will act in faith and trust Christ. Because commanded, God commanded me, I will obey him. Because God promised something, I will step out on faith and take advantage of what he has promised me. A father awoke one morning very early in the darkness and realized his home was on fire. He smelled smoke and went to investigate and found that at the lower level of his home, there was a large uh, area that was on fire. He immediately woke up his family and got all of them out of the house, and they met at a prearranged place at a big tree outside in the yard. All met at the tree except one eight-year-old daughter. The flames were raging in the bottom of the home, and he could not get back in the home. 
But in the meantime, his daughter had crawled out of her window onto the roof of a porch above the house and began to call, Daddy, Daddy, help me, help me. And the smoke was so thick that she couldn't see the ground. And the father came near to where the girl was and called up to her, I'm down here, jump and I'll catch you. And she said, but Daddy, I can't see you. And he said, it's okay, dear, I can see you, jump. In a few moments, after a little hesitation, she jumped into the arms of her dad, and, and she was saved from the fire. But let me ask you a question. What saved that little girl? Well, it's actually a combination of things, wasn't it? Was she saved because her father was on the ground? Well, that was part of it. Was she saved because her father was trustworthy? That's part of it, too. Was it saved because he was a good father? Yes, that's all part of the equation. Was she saved because she believed her father would catch her? No. She was saved because she acted on what her father promised to do. He said, I will catch you. You must jump. So the, the command was, jump. The promise was, I will catch you. So what does God say when he commands us to do something? He says, here's what you must do to obey. I will take care of you. Many times in the Christian life, I have found that I don't see God take care of me until I take the step of faith. When I take the step of faith, then God takes care of me. He's waiting for me to take that step of faith, to obey his warnings, his commands, and his promises. And when I do that, he'll stand behind me and take care of me and provide for me. I've seen that happen dozens and dozens of times. All those facts contributed to this little girl's rescue, but it was because she trusted her father's command and promise enough that she would be willing to risk everything and jump into his arms. Let me just tell you this. From life and from Scripture, faith, living by faith, always has an element of risk. Always has an element of risk. Because you don't see how it's going to work out until you take that step of faith and obey God, and then God steps in and takes out. We'll look at some promises here in just a minute to verify that. Look at this. If a professing Christian is to learn to live the Christian life effectively, he or she must learn to walk and live by faith. You must learn that. When I first became a Christian, I was 18. I hadn't walked by faith. I had walked however I wanted. I did whatever I wanted within reason. <laughs> the fact was, when I became a Christian, I had to learn to trust God. I had to learn to step out and trust him and wait for him to care for me. Now, let's look at some illustrations. The Bible is loaded with illustrations, so we're just choosing a few. But it illustrates, each one of these illustrate how important it is to walk by faith. First illustration is crossing the Jordan River by faith. Israel had been in the wilderness for 40 years. They're now coming to the time where Moses had passed on. Joshua is now leading the people of Israel. And they're told to go to the Jordan River and cross over the Jordan. The priests were to have the Ark of the Covenant on poles on their shoulders, and the priests were to lead. Everybody else was to be about 3,000 feet behind. And so the Bible says that they were commanded, and let's just read the verse here, and it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the, the Lord of, the, of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand in a heap. Now this was different than crossing the Red Sea, because the Red Sea was like a huge lake, and the waters parted, and they, the walls of water were on both sides. This they were crossing a river that had a downstream current. And so what happened was the, wall, the water stopped coming downstream, and there was a wall of water, just like a God-made dam. And God made this dam so that it would not go and take all these people away. So there's a huge wall of water here, and they walked across. But look what it says. It says, when they put their feet in the water. This is significant. Now suppose these people had been like most Christians today. Most Christians would have stood by the water and said, now God, as soon as you part the water, I'll walk across. And God said, no, as soon as you put your foot in the water, I'll part the waters. So they had a little argument there. They said, God, you part the waters and I'll go across. God said, no, you put your foot in the water and then I'll, then I'll part the water. You see, faith was not believing that God could 
part the water. Faith was not knowing that God wanted them on the other side. Faith was stepping in the water. Faith had an element of action before they saw God work. As soon as they put their foot in the water, now remember, this was flood stage, so if you've been in flood waters, you know that the first step is not the easiest step because you don't know what you're stepping into. Usually it's cloudy water, and you don't know whether you're going to go in up over your head or what. They, by faith, they took that step. Was there an element of fear there? Sure. Was there an element of risk? Yes. Was there an element of uncertainty? Yes. But they took that first step just as God commanded them, and God parted the water. Next, fishing by faith. In John chapter 21, verses 1 to 11, Jesus commanded the disciples this. He said, cast the net. Remember the story here. They had been fishing all night. Professional fishermen fishing all night had not caught one thing. And Jesus stood on the shore, and he said, cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. This is both a command and a promise. Cast the cast the net, and a promise you will find. The disciples had fished all night with all, all success, and I believe they said, Lord, we fished all night, <laughs> arguing. We don't know that this will work, but nevertheless, because you said so, we'll cast the fish on the right, we'll cast the net on the right side of the boat. They obeyed. Would the disciples have caught any fish if they wouldn't have obeyed? No. Did they catch fish because they obeyed? Yes, so many that they... The nets could barely hold it, and they couldn't, could barely get all the fish in that had come into the net. God was waiting for them to obey. And as soon as they obeyed, God worked an amazing miracle. You know, I think one of the reasons most, most Christians, many Christians at least, fail to surrender their lives to Christ is they say, I am afraid that if God, if I yield my life to God, God will make me do something I don't want to do. I can remember before I was saved, or before I had surrendered my life to Christ, rather. I'd been saved, but I uh, was about a year and a half till I really fully surrendered my life to Christ. I can remember thinking, if I surrender my life to Christ, I'm going to have to go to Africa as a missionary. Now, we have a brother who's visiting today, going to go to Africa as a missionary, and he showed me a picture of the place where he's going, folks, it is the lap of luxury, except for the hard work of missionary life. It's a beautiful surrounding, except that it's very difficult and hard work to win people to Christ. But we think the worst is going to happen to me. That's not true. The best happens. When we give ourselves fully to Christ, that's when the best happens. That's when the joy happens. That's when the thrill of serving God happens. That's the wonderful truth. So they said, but Lord, we fished all night. Okay, okay. Because you said so, we will. And they threw the net, this huge drought of fishes. Would they have caught the fish without obeying? No. Did they caught the fish because they obeyed, in part, and because of the promise of God? Let's look at another thing. Um, giving to God. We don't really make a lot of emphasis in our church about giving. People have been faithful to give over many years. But I think that this principle is really significant because giving to God is more about faith than it is about money. Uh, look what the Bible says here in Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. Give, and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet, with all it shall be measured to you again. Now, what he's saying here is simply this. The first principle is give. And then what will happen? Then it will be given to you. If you give, it will be given to you. That's the principle. And if you don't give, then it won't be given to you. Give, and it will be given to you. That's the principle of Scripture. Look at the stewardship in, is in a wide variety of areas, actually. Stewardship is the wise management of what God has given us, including care for your body. You have a body that God has instructed you to care for. You're just going to get one, by the way. So take care of it. Exercise it. After Christmas is over, go on a diet. Don't worry about it this week, but after the Christmas, do not. Use your gifts and abilities for God. Use your time wisely. The care of your finances wisely. In Malachi chapter 3, the scripture has the same basic principle. 
and verse 8 and verse 9, which are not up here. I'll read verse 10 in just a minute. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You're cursed with a curse because you have robbed me. Even this whole nation. Now on our text here before in the screen. Bring ye all the tithes. That's the command. Into the storehouse. That there may be meat in my house. And prove me therewith. Look what it says. Bring that ye may prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. For if I will, and, and if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. If you give, God will take care of you, and he will provide for you. And notice also, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. When Israel was in the wilderness, 40 years, you ladies would not like this. Their shoes did not wear out. They had one pair of shoes for 40 years. Can you imagine that, ladies? They wore the same clothes all those years. Why? They didn't wear out. God rebuked the devourer. God will make what you have last longer, not wear out, not break down. Um, uh, as you know, when I was in seminary, I sold cars for a living. And uh, my dad was a car dealer when I grew up. So I've kind of been a car person over my years and have enjoyed having a variety of cars. By God's grace, I have never had a major repair that I, wasn't, that I didn't know in advance when I bought the car that I would need to make that repair. Um, I had a diesel uh, GM product years ago, and um, they were notorious for blowing head gaskets. Well, that was a five to $900 repair. Well, I had a diesel, and it needed a head gasket replaced. But it just so happened that I had led a man to Christ in our, and he began to come to our church who was a mechanic. And he said, you buy the gasket set, and I'll, I'll change them for you. I think the gasket set was 45 or $60, something like that. And I watched him, and in two or three hours, he repaired it. I don't know how long it took. He was a master. It didn't take him long. But God took care of me. Shall men give to you? That's, God just takes care of us. God is concerned as a people that we learn the principle of being generous and seeing how God can take care of us. Give, and it shall be given unto you. That, that's a great principle. Look number four, the fourth example. The blind man in John chapter 9. Jesus met this man who had been blind many years, and he um, met him at, near the temple, and uh, Jesus reached down and took some dirt into his hands and spit in it. This would not go over too well with people who are very sanitary today. But he spit in it, made a... Put a little pad of mud out of it, put it on both of his eyes, and told him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which was 100 yards away. Go wash. And he had to feel his way to the pool. And he washed, and he came back seeing. He didn't even know what Jesus looked like. Now, that man could have said, this is unsanitary. That's what people would say today. This is unsanitary. I'll not do that. Or people would say, uh, why should I go down there? Why can't I just wash for, with some water here at the temple? Jesus said, go down here and wash. He obeyed. And then he saw. You see the principle of Scripture? You act based upon God's warnings, God's commands, God's promises, and then God works. And God does a wonderful and blessed thing because you simply obeyed. Look at number five. Illustration number five. In evangelism, we're telling others of your faith in Christ. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. This is a command and a promise. Jesus said, Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you all way, even unto the end of the world. Now note what the key is here. The key is, go, and I am with you. Go, and I am with you. If we obey, things will be worse. That's what we tell ourselves in evangelism. If I go and I tell somebody about their sin and their need of Christ, our relationship will be broken. It will be ruined. Things will be worse. It won't work out. They'll never like me. They'll never speak to me again. No, the Lord said, look, if you go, I will be with you. I will be with you. You know, I've, over the last several years, I've really made an effort 
when I am around somebody who's lost to try to talk to them about Christ. And I've had those same feelings. Well, they won't like me. They won't accept it. They won't. And I found just the opposite to be true. Most people will accept the witness of the gospel. I've had people who have been unkind, and I've had people who've been smart aleck with me. Sure, that goes with the territory of giving out the gospel. But most people are sympathetic. Why? Because God says, if you go, I will be with you. Um, when we got Carly, our service dog, uh, for Leslie, uh, over a period of several months, I began to think about, you know, we should write a tract. We have so many people come up to us because they can't have their pet with them in a restaurant or they can't have their pet with them at the department store. Or they can't have their pet with, her, with them wherever we go. And so they'll say something to us. Dog lovers will come up and talk to us all the time about how wonderful she is and how beautiful she is. And some lady said, oh, beautiful. And I said, oh, thank you. She wasn't talking to me, though. She was talking to the dog. And uh, so I said to Leslie, we need to write a tract. And so we wrote a, a gospel tract that Carly was rescued and she serves Leslie. And we related it to God has rescued us and he has required us to serve him. And so because of that little relationship, we've given out literally hundreds and hundreds of those tracks to people who are dog lovers and who we normally wouldn't have an opportunity to talk to. The Lord says, look, if you go, I'll be with you. Rather than thinking it won't be well, it won't work out, God won't keep his promise, I'll be embarrassed. No, go, go, and God will be with you. God will take care of you. God will make this situation better than what you thought. Because the devil's tempting us all the time to say, look, if you do this, this will turn out bad. That's exactly what he wants you to think because he doesn't want you to share the gospel with people who are lost. Go, and I am with you, even unto the end of the world. I'll be with you no matter what comes, no matter what happens. Are there martyrs who gave out the gospel and lost their lives? Yes, there are, and there have been. But even their lives have been given for a good cause and for a cause that has been blessed. Often think of um, Bonhoeffer, the German pastor who resisted the Nazi and Nazism throughout World War II. And just weeks before the German Third Reich completely fell and Hitler commit, committed suicide and the Allies uh, overtook Berlin and the war ended, he was shot and killed for his faith in Christ and his obedience. Was his life wasted? No. His life counted for something. He would have been dead now, by now anyhow. But he gave his life for something useful. Go, and I'm with you. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to speak the truth. Don't be afraid to give out the gospel. Don't be afraid to give out gospel tracts. Don't be afraid to tell people they need Christ. The last illustration we want to look at is found in 1 Kings. Would you turn there with me? 1 Kings chapter 17. A pointed example of what it means under a desperate circumstance to obey God and to see God wonderfully work in a miraculous way. 1 Kings chapter 17, and we're looking at, at verse 7. Elijah the prophet... Elijah the prophet uh, had fled from Jezebel. He'd said that there's going to be no rain for three years. And there was no rain, oh, a little over three years, three and a half years. And um, no, he actually said there'd be no uh, rain until I say so. And it was about three and a half years. And so he, he's uh, away from the city and away from the area where there are people for a while. And finally, he's directed to this city called Zarephath. And so look at verse 9, verse Samuel, or First Kings chapter 17 and verse 9. Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. And behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. Now, set the stage here. This woman is near the collapse of any hope that she has for furthering her life and the life of her son. She can't take care of her son. She has no food. And she said, verse 11, And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel 
of bread in thine hand. And she said, fear. This is fear. And she said, as the Lord my God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that, I may, that we may eat it and die. Now surely, mister, you're not going to ask for this food. Me and my son are going to eat our last meal. Surely you're not going to ask us to give this. Verse 11, verse 13 rather. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but first make thereof a little cake first and bring it to me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. Now, what did she have to go on? She had the command, bring me some food first. She had the promise, God will make the oil that you have and the meal that you have not run out until the rain comes. That's all she had, the promise. She had plenty of fear. She had the promise. And look what it goes on to say. It goes on to say in verse 15, And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. Now, this is an amazing event. Look at the story here. Just review this for a minute. First of all, she had to overcome her fear. That's verse 11. Verse 12 up here is inaccurate. She had to overcome her fear. Then she had to act on faith based upon his command and his promise. A man she had never known, a man she had never spoken to, said, give me your last bit of meal and I promise you, you'll have some more. And like many people, she could have said, right, and then gone on and eaten her food. And it would have indeed been her last meal. Then she was required to trust God's promise that God would make sure that she had enough to last until the famine was over. And last, she had to await, not very long, but she had to await God's provision. The story is never told here. We don't really have this detail filled in. But did you ever think about how that woman had enough to last? Did God just fill her barrel? And so she could see, I have a whole barrel full of meal, and I have a whole cruise full of oil. So now I know I'm never, running, never going to run out. I have to keep this quiet because I don't want the neighbors to find out because then they'll want my food. <coughs> I honestly think that every time she reached her cup to get more, moil, more, 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 meal, more meal, she scraped the bottom of the barrel and just enough to, for that next meal. And just enough oil in that cruise to pour out enough to make that last cake. And the next time she went to get meals, she scraped the bottom of the barrel. And the oil drained out to the last drop. But the next morning when she needed it, there was more there. God's provision for her was amazing. But that's how God works. God is going to ask you in life that you will give to him, that you will obey him first. And then you will see his provision. And then you will see how mightily and how powerfully and how amazing he can work if you will just obey. This is how we live the Christian life. The Christian life isn't so complicated that we can't understand it. It's so terrifying in some ways that we're afraid to do what God wants us to do. And because of that, we fail to see God's power, God's evidence, God's wisdom, God's provision in caring for us. One of the big obstacles we have to overcome is that obstacle of fear. Will we obey God? Will we sacrifice? Will we give to him what's rightfully his? Will we honor his commands and his promises? Will we risk everything to obey him? You know, this woman didn't just risk a little grain or a little meal and a little oil. Really, she risked her life. She risked her life. When he said, give me first, she said, if I, in her mind, she said, if I give to you first, I'm not going to have any left for me and my son. I, you're asking me to kill my son. That's what you're asking me to do. You're asking me to give this food to you and let my son die. 
But she said, I will trust God, and I will give this to you, and I will allow God to provide for me. Have you ever used faith in your life like that? Where it came down to a desperate situation, it was between life and death. It was between faithfulness and unfaithfulness. It was between God and obedience to him or not. That's what faith is. Now, God said, that's how we're to live. That's not to be an occasional experience. That's how we're to live. You kids go to school, and all the kids there, most of the kids there are ungodly. Will you speak up? Will you show them that you know Christ? You know, look at, um, look at your lives, adults, whenever you have some discouraging circumstance come into your life. Something you didn't want, something you wouldn't have brought if you could have chosen to have it, you would, you would have excluded it. Some unpleasant experience, some heartache, some trial, and it came into your life. And how did you respond? Anger? Complaining? Disappointment? Sorrow? God treats me this way, I'm not going to serve him. Abandonment of God. When God said, all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Do you believe that enough to rejoice before you see the end? Or do you just start complaining away? You see, before the blessing comes, we have to cross that bridge where we go from I'm terribly afraid to I'm willing to obey. That's the same bridge. I'm terribly afraid, but I'm willing to obey. And when you get over to the other side, that's when you see the blessing of God. You don't see it on this side as you say, God, you work everything out, and then then I'll serve you. You work everything out, then I'll witness. You ask somebody to come to me and say, will you show me how to be saved? Then I'll witness. Don't expect a witness very often if that's your mode of operation. We trust him. We take a step of faith. And we obey. That's God's plan. Have you had opportunities to live by faith? Today? Or this past week? Are you willing to live by God's warnings? God's commands? God's promises? Are you willing to live that way? Are you willing to risk that? Did you pass the test or did you fail the test? What does our text say back in 2 Corinthians 5? For we walk by faith, not by sight. That's why the passage says, we are confident, willing rather to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. God gives to his believers assurance so that I know that when I die, I'm going to be in heaven, just as much as if I was already there. That's assurance. That's not a wishful thinking. That's assurance. Faith is simply this. You must believe God's warnings, Command or promises, you must act according to that warning, command or promise. Don't wait for God to work out all the details and then take your step of faith because it's no longer faith. Then it's sight. If if you had a bill come for $1,000 and you had nothing in the bank, it would take faith to say, I'm trusting God to take care of this. If you got a bill for $1,000 and you had a million dollars in the bank, would it take faith to say, I can pay this? No. Sight. I'm not saying if you make a crazy bill, God's going to just give it to you. But you have a legitimate thing that's concerned, and he said, I will provide your needs. Uh, Philippians 4.19, God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Will you trust him? That's my question. We trust him. Faith has three aspects. Number one, faith has decisions that are based upon God's warnings, God's commands, or God's promises. We make decisions. We live by making decisions. We live by saying, this is God's command, this is God's will, and I will step out and I will obey him. Second, faith requires action. Faith doesn't require sitting on your hands and saying, I believe, I believe, I believe. It's not like uh, the Wizard of Oz when Dorothy is saying, I believe, I believe, I want to go back to Kansas. It doesn't happen that way. It's taking action. 
Faith is taking action. Faith is not a, 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 an inanimate object. It's an object of action. I will act. I will believe. And third, faith expects God's response. It expects God's response. I don't obey thinking that God will never work. I obey thinking he will, and he will provide, and he will care for me. So we're bringing this to a conclusion. And as we conclude, let me just ask you a couple of questions. Have you heard God's warning that you're going to die one day? Have you acted on faith to repent and place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you trusted him? Call upon him now. Ask God to forgive you of all of your sins. There are many. You don't deserve heaven. You're not good enough to go. You don't deserve to be there because heaven was prepared for saved people, not lost people who thought they were good, but for uh, sinner, sinners who knew they were bad and needed a Savior. Trust Christ. Ask him to be your Savior. When you face life's challenges, the second question, do you resist your natural fears and act on faith, or do you obey God's commands? Are you relying upon God's promises, or are you relying upon, well, if I can see how everything will work out, then I will do it. <clears throat> when Adoniram Judson left America as the first American foreign missionary, he journeyed from Boston around the Cape of Good Hope, Africa. There was no Suez Canal back then around the uh, Cape of Good Hope, around Africa, and over to India. It took him five months to go that distance because he was convinced that God wanted him to go and reach the heathen. The same thing with William Carey when he left uh, England and went to India. Someone said to William Carey before he left, Young man, if God wants to reach the heathen, he'll do it without you. No, God wanted to reach the heathen, and he was doing it with him. The fact is, God necessitates your response to his warnings, his commands, and his promises if you're going to be a faithful believer. Stop being afraid. Trust God's care. Expect him to work. Learn to live by faith. You know, you've heard the expression, Take a step of faith. <laughs> Usually people take a step of faith before they take a leap of faith. But if you take enough steps of faith, you'll have confidence to take a leap. But if you never take a step, you'll never take a leap. When you pray about little things and you see God taking care of you, and you give a little bit more, or you do a little bit more, or you witness to that person that you thought would reject you, and you see God take care of that situation, and God take that into hand, and you see God intervene in your life, that encourages you to take another step. But if you never take a step of faith, you will never be encouraged to take a big step. And your Christian life will always be little tidbits of steps, little tiny steps. So you take a big one. When I was a youth pastor in South Carolina, a man came to me. I, w I directed the visitation program, and every week I'd go out and do some visiting, soul winning. And so this man came to me one day, and he said, I'd like to go visiting with you. So I said, okay. He was 55 years old. He, had a, he and his wife both had a responsible job at the hospital. Uh, he was a lab technician. She was a nurse. They both had good jobs, good income, stable family. A stable home and everything. They had finances that were adequate for their needs. And uh, so we went out visiting. He said, I've been in the laboratory at the hospital for 30, 35 years. But I've always thought in the back of my mind that someday I'm going to go to the mission field. I said, well, someday better come pretty soon or you're not going to be able to go at all. So as we talked about this three or four weeks, he said, I made up my mind I'm going to go. He got in touch with some people who were, he'd had a Christian education, and then he had his medical training. He got in touch with some uh, mission organization, and he and his wife, within a year and a half, moved to Haiti and worked in a hospital there for many years as missionaries, going out to the villages and preaching, helping people with their physical needs. Why? 
Why did God give him that rich reward in life? Because he took a step of faith. He wasn't afraid. He stepped out and he said, I will obey God no matter what it costs. And God richly rewarded him. Friend, we must walk by faith. We must walk by faith. Not just talk about it. We must do it. Would you bow your heads with me as we close this morning? While our heads are bowed and before we conclude the service this morning, may I just ask you a couple of questions? Number one, has there been a time in your life when you personally put your faith in Jesus Christ? God's warning to you is you will die one day. Have you personally asked God to forgive you of all your sins and asked Jesus Christ to save your soul, trusting him and him alone for your eternal hope and destiny? I wonder who would say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I'm not sure I've ever done that, but I'd like to make sure. Would you pray for me? If you at home have never trusted Christ, this is the time to do that right now. Call upon God. Ask God to forgive you of all your sins and save your soul through Jesus who died for you. Let someone know what you did. Second question. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, is there a step of faith you know God wants you to take, but you have hesitated because of your fear? There's somebody you should witness to. There's something that you should give to God. There's something that you should do and you know God wants you to do but you have hesitated because of your fear. Would you say, pray for me? I want to walk with God, and I want to obey him. Would you pray for me? God bless you, and God bless you. Amen. Lord, as we bow before you, I thank you for your great love and mercy and your goodness and kindness. I thank you for your ability to make commands promises to give us warnings and then to back them up with your power that we can see your hand of blessing and power when we simply are willing to obey help these to make wise decisions of faith to obey you to love you and to serve you and we pray it in the precious name of jesus and for his sake amen we're going to sing a little different invitation hymn today and uh it's going to be when i survey the wondrous cross I chose this song because the second verse, the last verse that we sing, is I think probably the most heart-tugging verse in all of our hymnal. Heart-tugging in the sense that God just pulls at me when I read this verse to give my all to God. I want to read it, and then we'll sing it in a moment. We're the whole realm of nature mine if I owned everything. That were a present far too small for me to give to God. Love so amazing, the love of God is so amazing, it is so divine, it demands my soul, my life, my all. Not part of you, not a tidbit of you, all of you. God's not asking for a little finger or a hand, he's asking for all of you. Let's stand, shall we, as we sing. Red.
thank you for being here today. Brother Joe Arillo, it's wonderful to see you here this morning. Thank you for coming. Brother Joe was, was instrumental in starting our church many years ago and other churches in the area. I'm going to ask you to close in prayer, brother. Would you close in prayer, Joe? You don't need to stand. You're okay.